Coming up on the county line, we'll tell you about the perfect place to pick some homegrown produce. Reporter Chris Norris and I introduce you to a local self-proclaimed corn maze guide. And David Gregg gives us the lowdown on fantasy football in Titan Town Sports. We're live. We're local. The county line starts now. Yep. Good evening and welcome to the County Line. I'm Danielle Adams. And I'm Nikki Pizar. With autumn well underway, County Line reporter Chris Norris and I show you a great place to take the family for a little fall adventure. While visiting the Cool Spring Corn Maze in Mercer, we met many excited and adorable kids. Firefighter. You're going to be a firefighter. Yeah. This year's 10-acre maze is shaped like a train, inspiring one boy's Halloween costume. Yeah, I'm going to be Thomas the Tank Engine. One girl even thought this was a great place to celebrate her birthday. It's something different than just like, you know, everything that you have every day, you know, just going like roller skating or something. It was something different and it seemed like fun. But this young man enjoys the maze so much he comes back every week. Hi, I'm Wyatt Dean and I'll be your corn maze guide. Meet Wyatt Dean, a second grader from Mohawk Elementary, described by his mother as totally a farm boy. He loves to be outside running around. Here he feels very in his element. We live on a farm ourselves outside Newcastle and uh, my sister actually is uh, in partners with this so we're here every weekend pretty much. Wyatt had lots of experience navigating as Nikki would soon discover. Ready to go through the corn maze. Well, since Nikki's already in, it's my turn to try to find my way through the maze. Let's go. You guys can stand right here if you want. Okay. Come back and choose. Okay. I'm going to follow him. <laughs> I'm using my map here. I think I'm right around the train track, so let's see if we can get through the rest of this. Let's go this way. I can't keep up with this kid. Even though I'm a guy, I wish I could ask for directions. So what would you say is the best part so far? The wheels and the dance. It's easy to get lost. I think I'm lost. This is cattle corn. The cattle eat it? Yeah. So it's not for humans to eat. Yeah. Man, this is hopeless. I'll just eat some corn while I'm out here. <coughs> this doesn't taste right. Good thing Wyatt knows his way around here, because I sure don't. That corn was a bad idea. What is the caboose? Where where is that on the train? Uh, okay. At the end? It's the last car? Does that mean we're possibly getting toward the end? Let's keep looking. I think we're getting toward the end. Do I want to go this way or that way? Or maybe this way. But am I supposed to go that way? Look, isn't that the end? All right, let's go. Good job. High five. Yeah. I wonder how Chris is doing. Man, why couldn't Wyatt be my corn man's guy? Well, it might have taken me a while, but I finally made it. So, Nikki, how'd your adventure through the corn maze go? You know, I had a lot of fun, but I definitely had a help from a guide right here. Thanks, Wyatt. Well, I didn't have any help, but I made it through after I got a little lost, but it went okay. That's good, that's good. Reporting from the Cool Spring Corn Maze in Mercer, I'm Nikki Pizar. And I'm Chris Norris for the County Line. When you think of fall, corn isn't the only thing that comes to mind. Homemade apple cider is a perfect solution to a cool fall evening. 
The Apple Castle in New Wilmington, located off Route 18, grows more than 50 varieties of apples throughout the season on over 20 acres of land. This local farm market has plenty of other sweet treats to choose from, such as donuts, jams, jellies, and honey. The Apple Castle is open from 9 in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evening. New Wilmington is gearing up for Halloween this year. Trick-or-treat hours are scheduled from 2 until 4 in the afternoon on Saturday, October 27th. Kids can also enjoy a Halloween parade and carnival along Market Street beginning at 5 in the evening. And coming up, reporter Pamela Marlowe takes a closer look at the activities planned for this year's mock convention. And David Gregg will let you know who to play and who to bench for your fantasy football teams in Titan Town Sports. Stay tuned, more County Line is on the way. yourself at Westminster College. Westminster offers an educational experience that is second to none. We've been exceeding students' expectations for 150 years. Westminster combines the prestige of a national liberal arts college with the personal attention you deserve. Westminster is a national leader in graduation rate performance and is the most affordable national liberal arts college in Pennsylvania. Visit Westminster's beautiful 300-acre campus to experience an ideal learning environment. Succeed at Westminster College. A local high school teen is now facing a number of felony charges this week. Police arrested a 15-year-old student after he turned himself in to authorities for making a bomb threat at Mohawk High School last week. The teen is accused of assault, making terroristic threats, and making threats to use weapons of mass destruction. Police say they filed the charges after investigating a threatening handwritten note in the boys' restroom. A Mercer man faces a number of criminal accounts after he was arrested for soliciting 13-year-old girls for sex via an internet chat room. 29-year-old Christopher Lee Glassiter is the 99th alleged child predator arrested by the Pennsylvania's Child Predator Unit. The state's attorney general says the girls Glassiter thought he was targeting were actually undercover agents with the Child Predator Unit. And Pennsylvania State Police are reminding motorists to slow down when traveling to the land. complained to the Valant Borough Council that cars weren't yielding to pedestrians in the town's crosswalks. Drivers who ignore the vehicle code will receive a $50 fine. Reporter Alex Hines talks to local business owners about their concerns of the traffic violations. Valant is a local town known for its many attractive shops and its proximity to the Grove City outlets. But one problem the Valant community faces is the speeding that goes on down the main street of the town. Karen Rockenstein is the president of the Valant Merchants Association, and she says the main issue is one of the safety of their patrons. It's a safety issue for people that are in town because people get into looking at the shops, looking around, and maybe not paying as much attention to crossing the street as they should be because they think it's a small, quiet town. But And there have actually been a few trucks that have lost their brakes and they've come screaming and amazingly, they haven't hit anything or anybody. But it is, you know, safety is the main concern. Rockenstein isn't the only one aware of the problem. Cheryl Geidner is another merchant in Valant and she has some ideas of how to take care of it. You know, less speed, maybe 20 miles an hour, and possibly have some type of, you know, police force, whether it's the state police, occasionally um, sit in this area so that they can stop speeders, and maybe that might deter 
them from doing that in the future. The Volant Borough had acquired signs to alert drivers to the crosswalks, but over the past months they've all disappeared and the borough can't afford any more. In Volant, I'm Alex Hines for the County Line. A Westminster tradition will undergo a few changes this year. County Line reporter Pamela Marlowe gives us an inside look at the changes convention participants can expect to see. Years save one since 1936. Westminster College adds a little red to their college colors of blue and white for a political event rich in history. Westminster's mock convention is happening once again this year on campus. And just as national political parties and systems have changed over the years, so too must Westminster's political event. The times have changed. We need to modernize it to accommodate however many people want to participate because uh, participation has gone down. We've had to uh, do a lot of quick planning because we've moved the convention earlier than it's ever been before. Uh, mm -hmm. The earliest it's ever been was four years ago when we held it in the first week of February. Principally because the parties have moved their primary schedule up and we want to have ours before the students are influenced by what's happening in the in the political in the real world. Usually occurring during the true election year, this year's time restraint is also the reason eight specific regions will be student identified instead of representing each of the 50 states. We had to make it smaller to accommodate time because we have such less time than usually people had in the past to organize it. And finally, delegates will be explaining their platforms from the intramural gym on the campus of Westminster College this year for a change in venue for only the third time in the convention's 72-year history. Nearly eight decades have passed, numerous presidents have come and gone, and the scenery in New Wilmington looks a little different than it did in 1936. However, ideologies have remained constant since the first mock convention held in this building known as Old 77. It's a lot of fun, and it has, I think, been said a million times now, but it's the second oldest mock convention in the country, so everybody should participate because it's history. I'm Pamela Marlowe for the County Line. With only a couple of weeks left, this year's mock convention at Westminster College is still in need of student delegates. The convention tonight. organizers yes. remind students yeah, uh, and North locals Carolina that everyone can participate the in the event, upside, no matter their party the, affiliation. The this year's convention uh, will take place it's, it's on really November 7th and 8th, really featuring keynote speaker Bill Press. Really Nikki now joins state, us on the interview the set with a local resident trying really to keep impressive. the legacy mm -hmm. alive. I'm Nikki Pizar, and I'm here speaking with Westminster graduate Charles Mansell, the son of Thomas V. Mansell, who founded the Westminster Mock Convention back in 1936. Charles is an attorney in Newcastle and lives right here in New Wilmington. We're here today to speak about his father's legacy of this long-standing Westminster tradition, as well as his own experience of the Mock Convention. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, first of all, I understand your father was a 1929 graduate of Westminster who returned to teach in 1933 after attending Harvard Law School. And a couple of years later, he decided to present the idea of the mock convention to one of his um, government classes. How exactly did he come up with the idea for the mock convention? Well, he went to, uh, as you just mentioned, he went to Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. And while he was at Harvard, he roomed with a uh, graduate of Oberlin. Oberlin had already had a mock convention, and they ch obviously they chatted about that. And uh, when Dad got back here uh, and got into the swing of things, if you will, in the government class, it occurred to him it would be a nice, nice thing and an educational thing to do here. And I think that's, that's the basis for it. So he learned of this idea from one of his roommates, I believe, then? Yes. And they had already had... A, uh, what, a mock convention Oberlin, at Oberlin. Oberlin had already done that, and uh, they discussed that in some detail, and uh, Dad brought it home. Very cool. Why do you think it was so important for your father to start an event like this at Westminster? Well, Dad was always interested in politics, and uh, he followed that sort of thing. I can remember growing up that uh, in those days uh, it wasn't as professional, but you did have the TV coverage of the conventions, and, and that was always on the TV as, as I was growing up. And uh, I think he was interested in that. Uh, he thought it would be educational for uh, the students to learn that process. And of course, the best way you learn is by experience. So uh, he wanted to do that. And, and he also, uh, I heard him say many times that he also thought it was a lot of fun and, and uh, the kids should enjoy it. It wasn't just educational, it should also be fun. 
So Westminster was the third college in the nation to start a mock convention like I this? I believe that's right. I was, what was the, I can't remember the second one now, but there was um, uh, Washington and Lee. Washington and yeah, Lee, yes. That's right. Yes. And the mock convention has changed and grown over the years. How, how has it changed, and do you think these are changes that your father would appreciate? Well, everything evolves. So I think Dad would certainly uh, recognize that that occurs and would, uh, would approve of, of, the, of those changes, assuming, of course, they're positive. Now, you're a graduate of Westminster also, graduated in 1968. And what was your own personal experience of the mock convention? Well, I was uh, a couple of things. Number one, I was the chairman of the Colorado uh, delegation. Uh, which, which put me a little in a different light in the sense that I, I did get into some of the meetings that perhaps the, the delegates did not get into. Uh, but remember in 1968, uh, I was a senior uh, for that mock convention, and all of us knew that we were headed for the service. Everybody was being drafted out of college. So clearly the number one uh, issue for that convention was Vietnam and how we should handle Vietnam. So. Like, what was the atmosphere like when you were at the mock convention? Well, Mansion? the atmosphere, uh, my, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, and I'm not apologizing for that. Uh, but the atmosphere was probably a little bit more serious than it might otherwise have been because, again, all of us knew that we were going to the service one way or another and uh, had some feelings about that, had feelings about Vietnam. And I think that issue probably uh, made, made the entire experience a little bit more serious than it might otherwise have been. But your father always stressed that it was important for the, the students to learn about the process, but also to have fun. That's correct. That's correct. And how do you think events like the mock convention helped prepare you for your career as an attorney? I'm not sure it had any direct correlation to that, although uh, clearly when you're going through that process, it's a matter of negotiations and compromises and so forth as you uh, work your way through the various issues. So I suppose to a certain extent it would be uh, educational me in particular, but I don't think that was Dad's. Uh, Dad's approach wasn't for a career. Dad's approach was you, you need to understand what's going on. You need to understand uh, how these processes uh, evolve and how they work uh, so that you can in your lifetime at least understand uh, what's going on and makes hopefully makes you a more intelligent voter. So how do you think students can still benefit from this? Well again uh, I think it's the same thing. I think the students can learn how the process works. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be less uh, they'll be less naive in terms of dealing with national politics and better prepared to be a, a, a citizen in that respect. And I think, that's, I think that's important. I share Dad's uh, enthusiasm for that. All right. Well, thank you again. I'm Nikki Pizar, and I've been talking with Westminster graduate and attorney Charles Mansell. He is the son of Thomas V. Mansell, who founded the Mock Convention in 1936 at Westminster College. We've discussed how his father started the Mock Convention and why this Westminster tr tradition is so important. Again, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thanks, Nikki. All right, sports fans, now it's your time. Here's Dave Gregg with this week's Titan Town Sports. Good evening. I'm David Gregg, and it would be a safe bet that this is Titan Town Sports. Last week, we watched Westminster fall victim to a very good Thomas More team by a large margin. Things wouldn't get any easier for the Titans as they would host the nationally ranked team of WNJ. Harrowbury Stadium for the site of this game. WNJ comes in this game ranked 8th in the nation. They will start off early. Here you can see from the shotgun, Bobby Swallows hooks up with McCafferty for a big game for the Presidents, putting them in scoring position. Once again from the shotgun, Swallows drops back, finds McCafferty, who is his favorite receiver of the day. Westminster now, Kevin Franz drops back from the shotgun, showing off his arm as he is the senior, Brett Ziegler, for a big pickup for the Titans, down to about the 25-yard line. And from there, Franz, off the play action, finds Chad Rosatelli, who's been his go-to guy as of late, in for the end zone, putting the Titans on the board. Too much WJ offense, however, though. Bobby Swallows finds McCafferty once again, who is running like people are chasing him. He's going to get down to about the five-yard line for the Presidents. They would go ahead and they would punch it in for the score from there. Westminster trying to get back into this one. Nick McCloskey breaks off a good 18-yard run here for the Titans, getting him to about the 35-yard line. 
And from there, Kevin Franz, once again from the shotgun, hits once again Chad Rossitelli. Would not be enough as the Presidents would go on the win. It's 158 to 6. Westminster will travel to play Bethany now, who is 2 and 4 overall and 0 and 3 in the pack. The Wilmington Hounds would also be in action defending their backyard Friday as they would match up against their rival Sharon Tigers. Greyhound Stadium is the place for this game. We're going to have a great game from the Greyhound and Sharon, or Warren rather. Right off the bat, Warren quarterback Jeff Eaton hits Mitch McTavares for the big game. He's going to go in for the score here, putting the Presidents up early. Want me to a bounce right back, however. Luke Yeoman, not Chris Burns. He's going to break off a big run for the Hounds, getting them within scoring position. And from there, if some is good, more is better. More from Yeoman. Takes it around the right side in for the score. Coming up now, we're going to have the hit of the night. Chris Burns not only doing it on offense, but he can also do it on defense right here. As he lays out Matt Stapleford. And the Hounds will get the ball back from there. And one Burns to another, this time Derek Burns. Use the stiff arm, breaks off a big run before he gets knocked out of bounds. And from there, the Hounds, Colin Falkman, the quarterback, would call his own number, take it around the right side for the score. The Hounds would go on to win this one, and Varelli would talk about spreading the ball around. Tonight was other kids contributed besides Chris Burns, and that's what we're, we're after is some other running backs to carry to. Wilmington would go to play Sharon this week. And that will bring us to our Titantown Game of the Week. This week, the game is brought to you by the high schools of Mars and Nishanik. The Shanik plan hosts the Mars in this matchup. Mars would come out early fighting fast. See quarterback here, gives it off to Billy Blair. You're going to hear his name quite often in this cast. Takes it in for the score, putting Mars up early. And then from their quarterback, John Brake. Taking it, has some great blocking around the right side, finds a gap, and he's going to get into the end zone where he has reservations for six. And more from that potent Mars offense, Billy Blair once again breaks off a big run for Mars, and he's going to take it in for the score. Mars up 21-0 at this point. The Shandick trying to get back into it. Here you're going to see a touchdown pass from Emmanuel Mitos to Anthony Timiello. But it would not be enough in this one as Mars will win 42-6. Now, over the course of the week, we have some great individual performances here at Westminster worthy of the PAC Athlete of the Week honors. This week, we're going to give the award to the familiar face of Jessica Cooper, who averaged four kills per game in three matches, including a team-high total of 16 kills against Grove City and 15 against Geneva on Saturday, while posting seven total blocks. And as always, there will be a ton of Titan action this week, beginning Friday, when the women's tennis team is at Erie playing in the PAC Championships. And a lot of action coming at you Saturday. The men's and women's swim team will be competing at Clarion Fall Classic beginning at 8.30 in the morning. Both soccer teams will travel to Grove City. The girls playing at 1, while the boys take the field at 3.30. And finally, the volleyball team will be at Grove City as well. The match beginning at 4 o'clock. And now with football in full effect, people are catching the fantasy fever. We at Titan Town Sports thought we would help you in your fantasy football decisions as we debut our version of the Fantasy Minute. What do Philip Rivers and Chris Chambers have in common? Well, they both have been somewhat of a disappointment thus far this season. But they also have something else in common. They are on the same team. Chambers was recently acquired by the Chargers. So look for a performance improvement from players this week as the Chargers get off their bye. And now here are a group of guys whose stock will either rise or fall this week. First looking at the stock that will drop. Jeremy Shockey, Matt Schaub, Marion Barber. Now these players stock is expected to rise this week. The Steelers signs Ward coming back from an injury. Michael Bennett of the Buccaneers, D'Angelo William of the Panthers, and finally Brian Greasy of the Bears. And now it's time for extra innings. With the Rockies clinching their first playoff berth to the World Series in team history, they're waiting for their opponent, who will be either Cleveland or Boston. The Indians only need one more win to advance to the World Series. And in football, the Steelers take on the Denver Broncos this Sunday at 8.15 p.m. While the Browns are on their bye week trying to heal up some injuries, one of the big injuries would be Jamal Lewis. And that will do it for Titan Town Sports this week. Stay tuned. More County Line is on the way.
What are you doing out here? Straightening my hair. But why are you doing it next to your car? Oh, I just like to listen to the radio when I get ready in the morning, and this is the only one I have. You know you can listen to Titan Radio online, don't you? Are you kidding me? Titan Radio plays the hits you want. The best music from the 80s to today. Also on TitanRadio.net. Come on, boy. Come on. What do you got there, Yogi? Huh? What do you found? What do you got, little fella? Drop it. Looks like someone's butt. Man, they probably lost it playing with their kids. Hey, leave it. Come on. Come on. What's that? Check it out, Dave. What do you got there, Dave? Looks like someone's thunder thighs. They must have lost them playing in the snow with their kids. Let's get back to work. Most people go to the land for fly fishing, but trout is not on the menu this week as reporters Shana Marty and Megan Alexander take us out to lunch at the Neshanik Creek Inn restaurant. I'm Megan Alexander and on these cold gloomy days I get sick of staying on campus so I decided to take a drive down the street to see what Volant had to offer. Well Megan, the shops are what brings all the people to Volant, but what do you do when you get hungry? Someone told me that there was an amazing fish sandwich around here. Funny you mentioned fish sandwich because I heard that's just one of the specials at the Neshana Creek Inn. Let's go check it out. The Neshana Creek Inn has been in business for 16 years and is a great place to stop and eat after a long day of shopping. Owner Susan Hogelman explains that this eatery isn't just for locals. We get people from all over the world, believe it or not, that come to Volant. We have a guest book that people sign in and it just amazes us. There's probably every state and country represented. You're sure to find a clean, friendly atmosphere and many delicious homemade foods. We are famous for our giant cod fish sandwich. It's hand batter cod. And we can see why it's so popular. With the changing seasons, there's a change in the dessert menu, such as apple crisp and pumpkin pie, which are made with local produce. Summer and fall are the busiest times of the year. Hogeman is now open for business Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays for dinner. People come to see the fall foliage in this area, so we're very busy. After a long day of shopping, stop in the Neshanik Creek Inn for some homemade local favorites. Thanks for coming out to lunch. Reporting for the County Line, I'm Megan Alexander. And I'm Shana Marty. That's all we have for this week. Be sure to join us next week for the best of the County Line. We'll show you the best way to spend your fall holidays. And as always, David Gregg will have the latest and greatest sports news. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night. Good night.
closely might be receiving. Can you just give me a little indication as to the comparison between the private and the state facilities when it came down to the medical? I certainly wish I had more time to discuss that issue, which is actually an entirely another issue that can assume another committee hearing. Uh, medical care in prison is, is a huge issue, both for mental health care and for medical care. Um, and there have been numerous very good reports, New York Times, uh, Michigan's newspapers did a big article uh, series on medical care in prison, so did Delaware recently in the last two years. Uh, instead, I'm going to give you a story, and this will be very illustrative of how the uh, private prison companies approach prison medical care. Uh, keep in mind that not all private prison companies provide their own care, neither do publics. Uh, they contract it out to companies that specialize in it, such as prison health services, which is based in Brentwood, Tennessee, or correctional medical services, PHS and CMS are the two big boys on the block in terms of privatized medical care especially. But the story. At CCA South Central, the prison where I was housed, they had a contract doctor on staff, and CCA would pay a salary to provide medical care for prisoners. They entered into a contract with this doctor that would increase his salary if he decreased medical costs for prisoners. And the primary medical costs were prescription drugs and outside medical referrals. And not surprisingly, for 